Let us start the seminar. Uh, according to classification by Jan, but astronomy is an environmental science. <coughs> the question is how far the environment goes. And today at the town, we'll talk about galaxies who are aware of their environments. <laughs> Um, yes, indeed, uh, galaxies and the environment, it's a quite new topic for me. I started with this in spring, and uh, uh, this is <coughs> from uh, my own work, uh, it's quite uh, still in progress, so it's a bit of like a progress report, and uh, uh, this uh, presentation is uh, good for me for learning about the topic and also for getting feedback from you. Um, when we talk about the environment of galaxies, then uh, well, we can think of many different things, actually. Uh, so you can think of uh, gas, gaseous environment, for example, or uh, dark matter environment, or, or uh, matter density environment, anything. Uh, in, uh, in this case, I will mostly be talking about uh, environmental density at quite large scales. Uh, but uh, in literature also, other <coughs> estimators of uh, local environment have been used. So, uh, the main tool uh, it seems to be the most efficient tool, perhaps, of studying uh, uh, environmental effects on galaxies is uh, studying uh, galaxy color distributions. And it's quite, uh, it's quite simple. I just plot some color of, of galaxies, any color in principle. And you can see quite easily different effects on this, on this distribution. Um, this is an example of a, of a color uh, magnitude uh, diagram of a galaxy from uh, some early data leaves of the Slow Digital Sky Survey. And uh, the main features which you would notice on such plots is that uh, there are two concentrations of galaxies. One is the so-called blue cloud and the other one is uh, so-called red, red sequence, so it's a bit more elongated, and the blue cloud is more dispersed. And if you think of these uh, uh, isodensity contours as, as iso-height contours, then you would have a green valley between these two peaks. And so there is some amount of green galaxies as well. But most galaxies are either blue or red. And um, here is the same data set split according to the luminosity, uh, absolute luminosity. And you see that uh, moving from uh, high luminosities to low luminosities, um, the red peak is replaced by the blue peak. And in intermediate, luminosity cases you have both peaks. So wh why would there be such bimodal distribution? Why are there two peaks? Of course, uh, the color of a galaxy is, is, a, is a derivative of its uh, star formation, star formation rate. And uh, actually, uh, very little star formation is needed to make a galaxy appear blue. So. Uh, if we see this bimodal distribution, then this is because uh, uh, when a galaxy has even a little amount of star formation, it remains in the blue cloud. And then when a star formation is, uh, is somehow stopped, then uh, quite rapidly the galaxy would evolve from the blue cloud to the red sequence. <coughs> and then quite few galaxies are in the intermediate region. Okay, so as you can see, then this color distribution is a strong function of the luminosity of the galaxy, so we have to keep that in mind. 
Why a color histogram is a good uh, estimator of uh, different effects on galaxies is also because uh, in different environments, in different environmental <coughs> densities, uh, we would have uh, uh, many different uh, influences, envir environmental influences on, on galaxies. And uh, many of them influence star formation. And, and as, as we, we see, uh, color is a very good indicator of star formation. Uh, also, in the history, and also currently, another aspect what people study is the morphology of galaxies. Uh, like, are, are they elliptical or spirals? So, if you compare different environments, say a cluster environment to a field environment, uh, you can count how many, how big fractions of galaxies are elliptical, how many are spirals, and you would see that in general, of course, uh, higher density environments like clusters, they have more ellipticals, and, and uh, in the field, you would have more spiral galaxies, and such studies have been done already back in the 70s, and also in this building. But uh, I will skip most of the historic part. In uh, more recent data sets, we have many more galaxies. So these are uh, more uh, smooth uh, data. Uh, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there was this interesting uh, program carried out where uh, people from the general public could classify galaxies <coughs> by eye into different morphological types. And when we look at these color color, and now uh, stellar mass, not luminosity diagrams, but it's quite, quite the same. You can think of it as, as quite the same. Then uh, when these diagrams are separated according to the morphology of galaxies, then we would see that indeed early type galaxies, they populate mostly the uh, red sequence and uh, the Late type galaxies, spiral galaxies, they are in the blue cloud. But not only. You see that some early types are also blue, and uh, quite many late types are actually also red. And even more, you would see that the dispersion of colors of late type galaxies is actually much larger than that of the uh, early type galaxies, and even <coughs> that far that uh, late type galaxies can be redder than <coughs> the reddest early type galaxies. So uh, we see that uh, morphology is not as good as indicator of any evolution or, or environmental effects uh, as is the color. Color is, seems to be more sensitive, more uh, better. <coughs> so uh, what happens to galaxies in different environments? Or if you have a high-density environment, how does it influence the galaxy? Uh, you would see in, in the literature such, uh, such terms as harassment, which is ice, I mean, the stripping, strangulation, cagistamine, or lamatamine, and cannibalism. So this is quite criminal activity going on. And what, what, what are these things? <coughs> Galaxy, galaxy harassment. This, uh, this occurs when one galaxy flies uh, past or through another galaxy at quite high speed, so that they don't really merge, but it's just a flyby or a fly through. <coughs> and a nice example is the famous Cartwheel galaxy, where <coughs> one of these uh, more compact galaxies has flown through another galaxy straight through the center, and then has changed uh, the morphology, which initially probably was something Milky Way-like, to a completely different morphology. So you have a star-forming ring uh, spreading out of the center. So this is galaxy-galaxy harassment. In this case, a smaller galaxy has harassed the larger galaxy. <laughs> but we don't know really which one of them. And stripping, uh, one 
thing what happens in uh, high density clusters if you have a galaxy falling into this cluster is uh, ram pressure stripping so in a cluster galaxy cluster the main baryonic component or where the most mass mass most of the mass is is uh, hot gas usually x-ray gas and this hot gas environment when a galaxy with its own gas component uh, hits it then this hot gas uh, like is ramming or, or pushing the gas of the galaxy uh, out so the galaxy in this case it's not so well seen as on the screen of my own computer but this galaxy i think it was virgo cluster galaxy it's flying towards the center of the cluster somewhere there <coughs> and then you see how matter is being stripped off so it's mostly you see dust and star forming regions which are uh, having been left behind the, the galaxy itself so this way uh, the gas and thus also star formation is removed of a galaxy which has fallen into a cluster or is falling into a cluster and this will of course affect its uh, later color properties but not, not so much the morphology actually other things like strangulation uh, this is when a galaxy is let, left out of its own gas it, there are various mechanisms um, among them ram pressure stripping or a straight stripping by a neighboring galaxy for example where the gas is removed by a more massive galaxy and as a result a galaxy which is left of, out of left without gas it will uh, it will not form any more stars it's, it will die and become red so this is strangulation uh, shock heating also <coughs> even if a galaxy can maintain its own gas within its uh, um, within, within itself uh, in a, a cluster environment especially in ma massive dark matter halos can uh, heat this gas up so that it uh, also becomes uh, unable to form stars it's too hot and of course, finally, cannibalism, uh, like galaxies, uh, more massive galaxies which uh, uh, eat their smaller companions or simple mergers where two roughly equal mass galaxies merge. This, of course, also affects both the star formation as well as the morphology of the galaxies quite strongly. And all these are, of course, functions of the environment, uh, but at a different uh, levels for example mergers and, and accretion of galaxies can occur in any environment but of course in more dense environments you have more events of uh, galaxy galaxy encounters but uh, shock heating and, and uh, <coughs> ramp pressure stripping they, these occur only in very dense environments like cluster cores so in principle if you can distinguish um, which environmental densities uh, result in which galaxy properties you can <laughs> attempt to separate these uh, these potential mechanisms for responsible for these transformations ah, this was something for myself and one question what uh, can be answered is, is a, it's a <coughs> big and popular question in galaxy studies is whether the properties of a galaxy are a uh, are, an, are a function of its own nature, how the galaxy was born, or uh, how it was grown up later in the environment, like the nurture. So it's a, a pun, uh, play your words in English, nature and nurture. Uh, the same is going on about hum humans, right? And uh, in, in the current uh, cosmological paradigm, we have the cold uh, dark matter cosmology and uh, time evolves then smaller structures initially small structures merge and form progressively larger structures and uh, uh, this results in galaxies uh, which initially were quite separated uh, by uh, current time they will all, almost all be found in groups and then so the role of the environment must be very very important 
on, on Galaxy Outlook. But it is uh, important to make difference between uh, uh, between uh, different effects of environment, for example, or, or different <coughs> aspects or different mechanisms. So, so if you have whether whether a high density environment does it influence directly the morphology or the color of a galaxy, or does it influence the the stellar mass of a galaxy, and this in turn has an effect on the morphology and star formation. So in principle, these aspects should be separated from each other, whether it's straightforward uh, environmental effect or is it effect through, say, galaxy mass. Uh, how to estimate uh, environmental density? There are many ways, actually, and, and uh, there are many more than listed here. But uh, the most commonly used are, uh, one is the local density estimator. So you measure uh, the luminosity of uh, neighboring galaxies and say you are interested in the fifth uh, nearest neighbor and its, its uh, distance uh, to the galaxy itself. So you measure how many, how many members you have nearby and how luminous they are. So say, for example, in this case, people have considered galaxies brighter than minus 20 magnitudes. And, and they measure the distance to the galaxy, and, and then they have this function. So the closer a galaxy, the more it enters the formula. Uh, so it's quite robust tool, um, but it usually is used in quite uh, local environments only. So when you go like several megaparsecs away, you would have probably hundreds or, or even thousands of galaxies, and it's, it's quite an uh, um, unsensitive, insensitive tool. You can also attempt to construct or reconstruct the real groups of galaxies where they belong to. So, for example, in, in this house and in many other places, people use this friend-of-friend -friend method. So you, you hope that you, you will uh, know which galaxies are really in the same dark matter halo as, as is the galaxy of interest. So you can, uh, for example, measure the number of members of, of, of this group or, or the mass of the group, or there are various uh, things with what you can apply to a group and then study the correlation between group properties and galaxy properties. And this is the most direct link to the dark halo itself where the galaxy uh, is, is living. The most, uh, perhaps, dumb method is to just simply measure the luminosity density field. You measure up to some radius how much luminosity is contained within a sphere. Why, why dumb? It's quite cool tool. It's a cool tool, but it's, it's completely blind of, of all uh, smaller effects, like, for example, is it, is it real group, what you're observing? Is it just a, a random uh, projection of galaxies? You don't really know. So in this sense, okay. it's, it's quite dumb. But you, are not mm -hmm. you don't know what you are not asking because you ask for the mm -hmm. density mm -hmm. But it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very good uh, tool because it's quite easy to calculate and you can extend it up to any, any length, any right radius from the galaxy. So we can study very different uh, environmental scales. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but still, yeah, it's quite blind of, of the real physics, uh, what is going on. Is it a real group, what you're <coughs> having, or is it... Uh, uh, is it uh, <coughs> but on large scales, it might be mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, so I, I, am, I, I will be using this one. Very information so, yeah. I, will be, I will be using most of this one, so yeah, I'm using the dumb method. So what have people seen recently in such studies? So uh, this is uh, the same <coughs> study where this galaxy, uh, visual galaxy morphologies have been applied from the Galaxy Zoo project. And uh, these are 
functions of uh, the fraction of elliptical galaxies or the fractions of red galaxies uh, in different environmental density levels and different uh, lines or different uh, plots they correspond to different uh, uh, stellar mass pins so, so each of these lines corresponds to one quite narrow stellar mass range uh, from uh, 10 to 9.6 to 10.11 stellar mass so not very broad coverage but it's, it's the Sloan survey so you don't have very broad uh, mass coverage there actually uh, <coughs> In both cases, you see that, of course, that uh, the denser environment you have, and this is uh, this uh, local density estimator where you estimate how many galaxies of given luminosity are within which distance. Uh, you see that with density, uh, you have both the elliptical fraction as well as the red fraction, they are growing. But the red fraction is growing much faster, actually, in uh, all stellar mass pins. So uh, this again stresses that uh, the color is a better estimator than, than the morphology. And one, uh, one reason actually why color is better is that uh, morphology usually takes much longer time to change. So you can in principle shut off the star formation quite rapidly in a galaxy. But the morphology, uh, it doesn't need to change at all or it takes quite a lot of time unless you have a direct merger of galaxies. But isn't that also a practical reason that color is easier to estimate? Well, there are some automatic it tools for estimating morphology, but in, indeed, the yeah, color comes. Color is much yeah. easier. easier color. But of course, color also has its, uh, its, uh, its problems. Uh, there are different effects which cause uh, redder color. For example, uh, a spiral galaxy, if you watch it edge on, you have a lot of dust extinction and it's redder. But it's, yeah. Also, if you take observation of conditions in slow, quite often in galaxy parameters are estimated on the central part, mm -hmm. the central part. Mm -hmm. So there is no such perfect estimate or characteristic. Mm -hmm. But for example, yeah, this galaxy zoo, although I think some galaxies have been already estimated by tens or even hundreds of people, different people. Mm -hmm. Still, the classifications are not uh, for a for an astro astronomer's eye. They are not very good. <laughs> so there, are, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is one uh, study, and their their conclusion was that there is clear environmental effect is present. And what is not plotted here, but what they also stress that uh, actually the distance from the group center is what matters a lot to galaxy colors and not so much, for example, the group mass. So if you have a more massive group, it does not affect these <coughs> trends so much. This was the result of this paper. Distance, this is absolute or relative distance, because groups have different sizes. And also groups of different masses have different sizes. I would think it was relative, but I, I cannot confirm really now. I didn't look into it that detail. Uh, relative would be more... Uh, Smart choice. <laughs> but then there was another paper from, from this year. People used uh, another galaxy catalog. It's part of a Millennium Galaxy and Group catalog. Uh, this is a much smaller region in the sky, and they have less galaxies there, but it goes two and a half magnitudes deeper than the Sloan. So you have uh, smaller mass galaxies better uh, represented there. And they used some, used some automatic uh, morphology estimator, which they claim is very good. And then uh, they also studied uh, different, different structural parameters uh, for the bulge and disk component. And they have many nice plots there. And uh, mainly they separate, uh, they look separately on the MMG is the most massive galaxy in, in, a, in a system, and then the satellite galaxies, which, which are all that are not most massive galaxies. <coughs> and uh, in principle, you see all the same trends as, as previously, and the lower galaxies uh, are, are more, you have this red, red or, uh, or elliptical here, uh, green ones are 
uh, lenticular galaxies and then blue ones are late type. So most of the late type galaxies are here in the blue cloud and, and green are more lenticular and then the ellipticals in the upper region. Uh, but for, they're of course different for, for the main galaxies and the satellite galaxies in the sense that if you look at single galaxies, uh, yeah, okay, you would have no single satellite galaxy, right? Uh, satellites are always satellites of something. So, uh, <coughs> but among the main galaxies, the single galaxies contain uh, many blue galaxies, of course, whereas in, in all the binary systems and in, in larger groups, uh, the blue fraction is getting, or, or the late type fraction is getting very uh, poor. While uh, in the satellite population, uh, the late type or the blue fraction uh, is still very significant. And uh, they studied also this mm, colored histogram, and uh, they, they found that actually the, the uh, ratios between uh, lenticular and, and uh, spiral galaxies or late-type galaxies, they don't change so much in the, with the environment, so whether it's a single galaxy or, or a binary or a group, uh, relative fractions are quite the same. Fractions are relative, anyway, yeah. Fractions are quite the same. Uh, and uh, this is both for the satellites as well as the main, main uh, galaxies of the, or the most massive galaxies. And uh, from these data, they, they drew a picture, uh, they did some modeling, and uh, how different morphologies and colors uh, change into each other, what are the mechanisms. So we have uh, a late type galaxy, spiral galaxies here, uh, early type or elliptical galaxies here to the right, and from top to bottom it's, it's bluer galaxies to redder galaxies. So so they suggest that uh, if you have, a, if you begin with a blue star-forming late-type galaxy, uh, so you can get it into a red uh, passive uh, elliptical galaxy uh, through simple star formation uh, declination. So star formation somehow is stopped, and the galaxy becomes red and passive elliptical. <coughs> You can uh, transform it into a blue star forming early type galaxy by removing at least some part of the disk somehow. So it's quite natural. Yeah, you have a spiral galaxy, you, you make it to you know, just the bulge or the, an elliptical morphology. So you have to remove the disk somehow. But it's, it's uh, through merging processes, it's quite, uh, quite common. Uh, a blue star forming early type galaxy can evolve into a red passive early type galaxy also, of course, through shutting down the star formation. Uh, in between, you also have the green galaxies with both types. And they, they say that there is no straight mechanism to uh, have a red passive uh, elliptical from, uh, from a blue star forming elliptical without going through the green valley. Yeah, of course, if you have star formation uh, being shut off, you have to pass the Green Valley. And you can also, in principle, go from blue star forming late type to red passive early type, but uh, it's, you need more tricks to do that. And uh, they, they couldn't find any way to produce uh, a red uh, Red elliptical from a red uh, late type galaxy. They were they were not uh, sure. Although in, in, if you if you have them in a cluster environment, then galaxy galaxy interactions are quite common, and you <coughs> shouldn't be that difficult. <coughs> so anyway, from this picture, these authors concluded that uh, environmental trends are, are insignificant, and most of the trends what you would find are actually the trend with stellar mass, which is uh, contradicting with this previous picture where you see that. For a given stellar mass, you have quite significant trends with the environmental density. So, a contradiction between these 
And although this paper uh, refers to the previous paper, it doesn't comment on the um, contradiction. In our, uh, in our group, what people have done, we have seen uh, environmental trends. For example, in this galaxy luminosity function paper, which Elmo did a few years ago, he used uh, a large scale luminosity density field, so it was up to 8 megaparsecs of all the luminosity contained within the sphere of 8 megaparsecs. And you plot the luminosity function of galaxies, so, so the number of galaxies for a given luminosity bin, and for different density levels, four levels are distinguished. Um, yeah, this, we have two sets of lines on, on these plots, ignore it. This was plus the extinction effect uh, estimated. But nevertheless, uh, you see that, uh, especially at the bright end, there is quite a big difference between different density levels. So uh, in higher density environments, you would have more brighter uh, galaxies than, than in lower density environments, where, where the most luminous galaxies are about up to mm, one magnitude uh, less luminous, so quite significant. So, and, and it's uh, almost similar within spiral galaxies as well as elliptical galaxies. So these are all galaxies, uh, spirals and ellipticals. So uh, well, this seems to support that environmental effect is, is present. However, uh, here it's only the large scale luminosity density field is used but uh, it's not really certain that it is the large-scale density what is influencing here, because the large-scale density also includes the small-scale density. So if you have a locally very luminous region, then this would influence your large-scale luminosity as well. But this was not considered in this paper. Heidi Lietzen also used the <coughs> large-scale luminosity density field, and he measured the uh, fractions of uh, uh, different classes of galaxies, so passive elliptical, star-forming elliptical, and so on, active nuclei, as a function of the density, again. Um, and she saw also quite significant trends uh, with environmental density, large-scale environmental density. Uh, also, from a different angle, uh, if you split the samples into low uh, density regions and high density regions and estimate uh, also the richness of the system, so how many members a given, say, a galaxy belongs to a group and how many members this group has. So, it, it, if it's a single, it is, it is one member system, of course. And, and uh, so, this would be like the, the small scale effect and uh, the large scale density, luminosity density field is the large scale effect. So if you study the aspect this way, you will also see that <coughs> actually it is different. So at the same group richness level, you would have uh, different uh, fractions of uh, different types of galaxies. Not, not that strongly anymore, but, but still. But again, uh, also in this study, Heidi did not take into account that uh, uh, in uh, more luminous uh, systems, perhaps um, the richness or the local density is also higher uh, through, the, through more luminous galaxies, maybe. But Heidi also maybe, do you have some more figures about this paper? No. He, he discovered that if you take groups of equal luminosity mm -hmm. in high and low density regions, and in high density regions mm -hmm. they contain relatively more mm -hmm. scale passive star mm -hmm. or galaxies. So she yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But anyway, this again confirms that, uh, especially or definitely, environment does affect. So, contrary to. Yes. Another. And uh, she added this that both small and large scale mm -hmm. environments. Yes, yeah, another study has said that yeah, groups uh, groups are different in uh, or 
small scale systems are different in large scale, different large scale environments. Yes. So, this one. yes. Mm -hmm. so now to my own work. Uh, uh, I started to look at also this uh, color uh, histogram. And as the data, I, I'm using the same stone disk sky survey, but the uh, rate is released with uh, 588,000 galaxies. Uh, this is a bit clean sample. The total number of spectroscopically uh, determined redshifts is about 1 million, but uh, many of these detections are, are still uh, uncertain. So after cleaning the sample contains that much galaxies and I use uh, friend of friend <coughs> groups uh, by Elmo and, and company and I also use uh, the luminosity density field by Johan and somewhat by Elmo uh, and I also <coughs> took galaxy zoo morphology estimates and then some mixed morphology estimates uh, from from other sources, let's say, and, and some local spices added. And I tried to split the galaxy sample by morphologies, luminosities, intensities into different pins and then look at the histograms. And I, I have not got very, very far yet. <laughs> um, but before going to the results, uh, there are several potential misinterpretation sources why, why your results can be misleading. If you get some results, the first thing is that you have to consider always the completeness when you have a survey like the Sloan survey, which uh, is a uh, magnitude limited survey, so, so you don't have galaxies less bright than a certain magnitude. So if you plot galaxy absolute magnitude with respect to the distance or the redshift, then you would have a such curved uh, edge of the of the sample, so uh, less luminous galaxies you cannot see very far, right? quite straightforward. So you would see very few low luminosity galaxies and, and many more high luminosity galaxies. So how to compensate with this? Or one, one way is to look at the, is to construct a volume limited sample by just using a very narrow uh, luminosity bin here, so which is roughly then or uh, not influenced by the, the this age shape. In reality, of course, it still is influenced. So this is one way is to look at maybe different uh, volume limited pins. Uh, other way is to uh, just simply me measure not the number but the density. So, for example, if we have a galaxy from this region, then <coughs> we know what, how big is the volume in which we see it. So we can uh, think that how many would there be if, if we see the whole volume? So we can compensate it, and this is like adding the weight to a galaxy according to the redshift or the distance. And the latter method is much more uh, is better if you have uh, not extremely large samples, uh, or if you want to split your sample into very small narrow bins, because you would have much more galaxies. So you, you use all the data points, not just a, a small selection bit. So I try to follow the latter sample, the latter, latter method. But also, again, this uh, luminosity density field, uh, if we use this as a, as a density estimator, then for, a, for a local, if we use, a, say, only one megaparsec radius for estimating the luminosity, you would of course have the galaxy itself in there with its own luminosity. So uh, if it's a luminous galaxy, it can be dominating uh, the total luminosity within one megaparsec. Right, so we, uh, in principle, you could construct this luminosity density field without this uh, galaxy itself, but it would be quite, uh, quite some task. And currently we don't have such luminosity density field. But what I tried is just to uh, remove the luminosity of the galaxy, just uh, subtract it from the, this density estimator. Uh, thus, uh, 
it's it's not very straightforward really because uh, the <coughs> luminosity density is not is it's plotted on uh, is, is measured from uh, greed and, and it's it's not simply by subtracting a, a single luminosity from from this number but uh, it seems to be working so far and the same for example if I have a larger uh, luminosity region then it would contain also the smaller ones. So if I want to be sure that I'm measuring the very really large scale effect, I would have to subtract, if I want to, for example, measure 8 megaparsec uh, region, 8 megaparsec radius, I would have to subtract maybe 7 or 6 megaparsec uh, sphere of luminosity from it to see that uh, I, I really don't uh, have the same luminosity in there. Was that understood? Yeah, I hope. So, doing this, uh, I can show that uh, actually, indeed, uh, both large scale and small scale luminosity <coughs> density field do matter. So, on these plots, there are combinations of uh, small or low, low luminosity density at small scales and large scales. There and, and high luminosity, corresponding high luminosity densities, and uh, then the color histograms of uh, all, all galaxies. So uh, up here, there is uh, at the fixed uh, large scale luminosity density, which is a low large scale luminosity density, I consider a high local density, high small scale density. Um, and this is uh, this uh, curve with the red peak, and then with a the small local density, it's with a blue peak. So clearly, uh, at fixed large scale density level, the local density does have a big effect. So blue galaxies become redder with local density increase. Yeah, that's quite obvious. And the opposite uh, in in, uh, in large in high large scale density levels, uh, also bluer galaxies become redder with the increase of density from local density. And the shape is it's a bit slightly different, but the principle is the same. But now fixing the small scale density and considering just the effect of the large scale density, here is the small. A low small scale density and a high small scale density, and then from uh, moving from uh, low large scale density to high large scale density. So the effect is much weaker than 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 this one, but it is present. It's the same effect. So you would have more redder galaxies in in uh, high density large scale. Environments. In principle, is this, uh, it is not exactly the same, but it is like uh, some uh, plot for uh, small groups because they have low, low local, de low small scale density. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, and one reason why, for example, this density field is much better estimator than, uh, say, uh, group richness is that group richness cannot go below one, right? <laughs> Yes. One galaxy you cannot go below, but uh, in, in density field you can always go further. You can always look at a bigger vacuum around the galaxy, yes. a larger vacuum. So there is no limit in, in using this density field. And for uh, now for high local densities, uh, the effect of the large scale environment environment is much stronger. You see that on the here the effect was visible but quite small and at high local densities the large scale environment influences much much more and uh, this is actually I think quite natural uh, because uh, if you have high high local density then uh, high large scale density means that this uh, this is a really large uh, supercluster or something mm -hmm. and then the, this seems to influence then the colors also intrinsically in, in, the, in the cluster center. 
will say that it is quite natural, but many people yeah. say that it uh, does not, logical identity mm. does not have any influence at mm. all. Yeah. So, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my main result. I, I'm not sure yet whether it's worth publishing. Maybe I need to do something else. Um, but also, this high local density might co mean uh, compact groups. Or but compact. Yeah, but, uh, but still within a, within a high, large, large scale density yes. level. This was yeah. uh, actually a comment on my own comment uh, that low local density may mean rich but low school. And, and another conclusion I, will, I would draw from this is that for uh, low density environments, uh, it's enough to use the local density. But for uh, high density environments, it's important to consider the large scale environment as well. Do you think uh, these those two lower panels, do they have any connection or could be connected to this result that we found that if we use group richness as local density estimator. Then we have very strong uh, dependence on large scale environment and also very strong change in galaxy content when we go from four groups up to about ten member galaxies to each groups. It seems to be that they are two different classes of groups to be using. What, what I did, I compared uh, Again, the color histograms of uh, if I used uh, the richness as, mm -hmm. dens as density estimator and, and these different radii, and, and uh, the group richness was mm -hmm. very comparable or almost uh, the same as, uh, as this one megaparsec uh, yes. smoothing. Mm -hmm. So, it produced really the same histogram. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, two different types of histograms. <coughs> Low local density and high local density. Okay, and uh, just to show uh, a bit more. Yeah, but, uh, but one more question about yeah. those two lines. But if you say low and high local density, which density levels do you use? Uh, Is that your report finished or not? <laughs> uh, almost, almost. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's say they contained uh, <coughs> between 1 and 10 percent of galaxies in each case, so it was around this, depending on the, on the, on the bin. But I wanted to show some color histogram animations. Uh, So this is now how <coughs> this is the small scale density, this one megaparsec density. And if we move through this small scale density with the whole galaxy population, uh, you see that uh, yeah, indeed galaxies become greater. There are many. The sample is not not still uh, large enough. We, there is still a lot of uh, noise. What is increasing from one shot to another? Uh, density, local density, uh -huh. one megaparsec oh, okay. density. Okay. And you see it's looping, and when it starts again from the low density, you see that the concentration is on the bluer side and it's moving towards redder. Okay, this was for, for all galaxies. Um, This is for uh, the same for low luminosity spiral galaxies. So you see, we start from from not really a, a blue peak, but it's a, a bit. Uh, it extends all the way to the red uh, red region. But in in higher density, highest densities, there is really no red peak appearing. So low low luminosity spirals they don't become red and dead in any environment.
Now, on the contrary, high luminosity spiral galaxies. They are always red. Relatively red. And Just the uh, red, red, the tip of the histogram is moving to the redder side. They, they also have high star lamas. Mm -hmm. What I would like to do is to use, uh, instead of luminosity, to use real, real stellar mass estimates, as good as they are. They are not, of course, perfect, but it, it should change a bit the, the results. So, what else? And for uh, elliptical galaxies, it's, it's much more dull. It's always the red peak, or the red, red sequence, just the, the peak. Here is the tip is even off, off the scale, but it's just slightly moving towards the redder edge. But the overall, overall shape and uh, is very constant. And the same is for high density, uh, high luminosity ellipticals. When you are talking about density, it is number density, right? Um, not uh, not mass density. density. Yes. The luminosity density field. Uh, this. this is rather mass density field than number density. Yeah, yeah. But this is not mass. But Within a sphere around the galaxy, how much uh, luminosity there is? In principle, it's the same as how much oh, yeah, mass yeah, yeah. there is. But so, so we're walking through different uh, density. Yeah, yeah, that was a dump method which you said. Yeah, yeah. Not the first one, which was a number density. Not the first one. The first one was also not the number density, it was more complicated. So it, it took into account how far a galaxy is. Yeah. And how, yeah, and also it's... But didn't luminosity. take into account luminosity? No. Uh, in a way, it was above a certain luminosity. So if you have a in very low luminosity companion, it, it should not affect much the, the galaxy itself. So these were usually dismissed. So yeah, this was, as I said, work in progress, but... Comments are evident. We have slowly well. moved to discussion already. May I say one comment? If you said that comments are welcome, that this is welcome comment, and I think this is very important to publish this. Maybe not just this, you have to do maybe something more. And this is important because people uh, quite often just reject this possibility that the large scale environment also is important. And we saw this also in Tallinn conference during the talks. And he did talk about this. Was, people were very pessimistic. So this is important. What I would like to do actually is, is to extend the radius even further than 8 megaparsecs. Why stop there? The effect is clearly present. Why, why not go to 20 megaparsecs, 100 megaparsecs? Let's see what happens. And but this is. Also I, I'm not maybe pressing Johan to do this because look. he has. Uh, also other duties at the moment. to other parameters of galaxies, mm -hmm. as you, you by yourself said, it's the galaxies, some of the combinations. Uh, uh, sorry, also Arvet had a question. Can some features, statistical or mor or morphological, which you studied for galaxies, be explained by dynamics? by evolutionary scenarios. Oh, that's future work for you. Dynamics, of, uh, dynamics of galaxies or intrinsic dynamics? Uh, dynamics, for example, if, if, uh, if this is dynamics of groups where they are located, then the answer is yes. What, what kind of dynamics did you mean? This would, which is uh, decisive for the problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any dynamics, yeah. Yeah. In principle, data are available, so it's just a matter of uh, study. Yeah. Are these environmental effects also kind of you can see it also in evolution? I mean, in time scale, the With slow uh, data no. change. But the extended slow data, which is now becoming public, it's already possible to, <coughs> to uh, yeah, significant evolutionary so is not distances already, but 
The problem is that samples which are good for studying evolution, they are, which go deep, they are really very narrow, so estimating the large scale density is impossible from there. So. Uh, more questions? Yes. <laughs> Question. How do you measure the brightness, not the brightness, the color of the galaxy? Uh, oh, that, that's, in a way, it's a good question because it depends on uh, on the annulus or, or where do you measure the luminosity within. And there are, I'm not actually really aware of how these numbers are being measured from Sloan. They slow. make photometry in five colors. And but I, I think that they apply some model also, so it's not it, measured within uh, some fixed aperture or something, but it's, they assume, I think they assume some surface brightness distribution mm -hmm. and they follow this model and yes, estimate this but way. In reality, they observe central parts of galaxies. So at least for brighter, bigger and more nearby galaxies, this colors may be somewhat wrong. But anyway, they have a uh, antidote, they have photometry in five colors, and then you can choose any of color pairs to calculate color index, but usually the game in is this. Yeah, because you, you and, and Z, they are quite uncertain. They are quite uncertain. So it, it, it can be that the spiral galaxy, galaxy with prominent polish and, and normal uh, the spirals uh, could be quite red galaxy and uh, the same spirals and small polish could be like very blue one. Might be. Yeah. But this doesn't depend on how you measure the brightness. Right? Well, if you zoom it, uh, take some yeah. average over the whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It might be, but this also means that, as we all know, with observational data, no data are final tool. Yes. Also, one thing what I attempted to do, but uh, what the current data does not enable is to estimate all these things for uh, separately for spiral, uh, for disks and bulges of galaxies. But uh, at the moment, I don't have data for disk colors and, and bulge colors. I have disk fractions and bulge fractions, but not the colors. So from also from the literature. So one thing what uh, Teet is currently working on or, or, or his PhD thesis was construction of this automatic method to measure disk and bulge properties. Also Boris had a question, yes. So, uh, it's more a comment to Teresa's question. That's just the story of Sloan. Nothing is measured uh, as precisely as possible mm -hmm. because so there are about six hundred thousand galaxies. So you can ask the physics to wipe out the those things. It doesn't work when you take it down to the galaxy. Only not when it works. Yeah, it, uh, this uh, question uh, might arise uh, uh, from the Green Valley, basically. Because <laughs> uh, it seems that it is kind of uh, st still, it, it was not very deep. It does the very first graphs, but it's very first graphs, and uh, yeah, it's kind of, to me, it and seems like this is some uh, effect of uh, summing up different, uh, no, different morphological well, it, it is probably yeah. present anyway. You, you have to pass through it when you yes. move from blue to red. Yeah. And also it's possible to move back, actually. There have been simulations where you will see different yeah. effects and galaxies, and uh, they do spend a, a bit of time in the Green Valley. Actually. Can this question be linked to the question that uh, if the estimate of color depends on the morpho morphology, is there any kind of study or whatever which would say that the, the methods used for estimate the color have it any dependence of the morphology of the galaxy? So use the same method for elliptical, and for spiral, and you will get a different result. Or it, it is, it is, it, or difference is not so big. 
or but not you, at all. You can or... estimate the morphology from one filter image only, and you don't have any color information. <laughs> yeah, but eye, uh, you measure you measure colors of <laughs> galaxies, right? Using some method, is there a dependence uh, in the result? I mean, uh, is there um, like you? you uh, studying the dependence on own environment, it could be also be dependence of color uh, from the well, let's say, morphology, yeah. from the morphology. Not the you you take the spirals, mm -hmm. all the spirals, and see if there is kind of systematic shift or something. Or oh, it is maybe a stupid question from a, a person who doesn't know these things. Yeah. Will the point scales such a large dispersion or a small one in this field? Yeah, picture? something like that. Well, maybe it's not so it relevant. It has uh, two features always available. Some points will be, but how something interesting or something not interesting? <laughs> I would say this is complicated because estimation correctly of different parameters of galaxies, as we already told, in slow. This is more statistical case. Uh -huh. okay. It might be that it, there are apparent dependencies because of that. But it is also really interesting to try to clarify that. <laughs> Anyway, the morphology is never very straightforward. You cannot estimate okay. morphology straightforwardly. So, for example, I have checked, uh, for example, from, say, bl uh, red spirals. When I, when I take the red spirals, which I see, and look at the images, then uh, it's not really clear for me whether they are really spirals or could they be very extended ellipticals. You see something quite extended. What it is, you, you have no idea, actually. But people have classified them spirals in some cases, okay. for example. Okay. Yeah, Arvid. One question of half ignorant uh, you had a graphic where distance and luminosity. Uh, the distance was given in linear scale, but uh, the uh, luminosities are logarithmic ones. This very l large uh, graphic. If both of them are in lo logarithmic scale, then it would, must be clearer and simpler. Why uh, this is made so that one is logarithmic and the other is, uh, axis is uh, linear? Uh, it seems to me that more interesting w would be so that uh, the, this person would not depend so much on the uh, but distance. You wouldn't really see this yeah. is the faint. As, as you uh, see here, is a, a low, uh, very near ones have a large dispersion, and uh, far, very small ones on this graphic. Mm -hmm. But if both in logarithmic scale, what will oh, then yeah. be? It must be not so much dis uh, uh, dependent on distance. No, it, 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 it would be dependent anyway. It, it, must, it must be dependent. It is dependent. <laughs> <laughs> but my much, uh, no, so much. Yeah, the, the shape would be different, yeah, but uh, it doesn't remove the dependence. <laughs> and also the point here is that you, we should use one of limited or magnitude limited samples, and this point remains the same. You can always choose a scale where you don't see the dependence, but uh, that's not the point, I think. <laughs> It's just a matter of how many photos do you get from, from uh, yeah, that's on, on your vector from that distance. More questions? I also have one more. Uh, what do you think if you change a method uh, for determining the local uh, density? If you not determine local density not based on luminosity but on that 
uh, those two other Where methods. Is, yeah, will, are, will, the, will the result be similar? I, I, have, I have compared this. I, I said this group, uh -huh. uh, group richness. I uh -huh. have compared it. It's really almost the same as, uh, uh -huh. as the luminous density. Okay. But just that uh, in group richness you cannot go below one, right? You have yeah. one member in, a, in every system. <coughs> so but in, in density you can go as, as deep as you want. But the dependence uh, is, 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 you find the same dependencies. Uh, yeah. They're very, very, okay. very equal. Okay. Uh, shapes That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Boris, please. Uh, so, as you know, I'm also quite interested in, in environmental effects of Gauss evolution. And I have this frustration <coughs> because this sort of uh, research has been done for many years now. Not only the slow, but even before that, where they take uh, some sample of some size, obviously the size grows with time. And uh, you try to see statistically with different uh, methods you make the environment, you, you put iron morphology or color, gas content, whatever, and you see how it depends. So I by, by enlarging the sample lately, it seems that it doesn't add new information to the picture. What do you think should, where should we push, what should we do next, how can we improve uh, our understanding of this? If, if you increase the size dramatically, then it, it, it helps to study the small effects because uh, also it, when I split the galaxies by density, by morphology, by luminosity, all of them, then the beams will become very, or the samples are very small, really. I will finally have like a few thousand galaxies per, per graph, and that's not enough, actually. But the global picture hasn't changed much from the beginning of Sloan until the SDSS 10. I, basically, what we knew back then, we know it now. I mean, we haven't added really much to our knowledge by, by now. I'm, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's question. What's, what's the question. What should be the next step? They, they ha I, I haven't seen papers which go really into detail. So, one thing is like separating the bulges and disks and, and looking at them separately. You can do things with larger samples which you cannot do with smaller samples. So, I would like to do that. Not just dividing between birds and mammals, mm. but looking more into the variety in, the bird, in, in birds. Or it doesn't mean that there must come something out of it, yeah. maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Would also the study of how it changes with time would be interesting, probably, how, how much it is done, because... Uh, well, that's the new for in samples. Yeah, really? exactly. But um, mainly, indeed, it's more important to extend the sample to some direction, like you have to have less luminous galaxies involved or go deeper in redshift and so on. That, that's much more important. And just to increase the, increasing the volume anymore, increasing the slow volume doesn't uh, have any point. Well, like having the same on southern hemisphere. The the sky should apply to the whole sky. Yeah. That, that's true. It's basically but they, they don't extend it anyway. I, I don't know if anybody plans to have a larger volume. And what also would be interesting to do is multivalent studies. Near infrared, near infrared, it's very whatever. Yeah, there are uh, well, available now. Yeah. Yeah. So, Vista surveys, photometric registers, but, but uh, I haven't, none of us has looked, I think, into this data. It must be quite interesting. Arvet had a short comment. If you use such logarithmical scales in both axes, then you will get this. Uh, uh, straight line for this curve we'll see in here. And maybe also the upper uh, will be almost line uh, because of the, the, the weakest galaxies must also something. Yeah, but the shape doesn't really matter. It's, it's important at least to show that uh, it's uh, unfair to just count these galaxies and compare it to these galaxies, right? There are simply less galaxies here. That's the point of this graph. So I, I, I can be in linear, linear scale. No, no. 
or logarithmic scale, log log or, or lin lin. No, lin log log will be yeah. a straight line. <laughs> this doing from galaxies to the unoccupied uh, region. But then you cannot fit this uh, intersection into it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Okay. okay, let's divide who is for curves and who is for straight lines <laughs> and vote. <laughs> okay, uh, any more questions? If not, then we will finish our seminar for today and there can be just private discussions if you wish. Thank you.